Hi, I'm David Mykolas. I'm going to talk today about uh, molecular dynamics with Python. The title is Molecular Dynamics is No Longer Scary with Python. And uh, you can learn to do it yourself using the FHIR algorithm and the software package called LAMPS. Okay, uh, first thanks to Tengmin and the whole program committee uh, for making the PyCon APAC 2022 possible. Um, I'm recording this in July for viewing in September, so it's not going to be as fancy as I'd originally uh, uh, envisioned. Um, but I'm going to be uh, updating the slides and I'll uh, at the time of the conference and put a link to a GitHub for the scripts. So we'll go through the scripts pretty quickly. Also, thank you to Professor Tang for his support and for making such a uh, an excellent environment to do research. And also thanks to all the students, his hardworking students, for making the research possible. Um, and a specific uh, thank you to uh, Jiayin, who uh, uh, has really helped with the Blender in Python for the visualization, as well as uh, uh, with the physics. Okay, last year I talked at PyCon uh, Taiwan about electron diffraction and how it can be used to study uh, two-dimensional materials on surfaces. Okay, uh, since then, uh, yeah, so here's, uh, we, we analyze these diffraction patterns and try to understand what kind of 2D materials are on the surface and what their configuration is, how the atoms are arranged. Okay, since then we've had a major upgrade. We've uh, um, improved our, our system, gone to a new vacuum chamber. We can move our uh, system to the, also to the uh, uh, accelerator beam line and do experiments or do experiments in our own laboratory. And uh, we're getting uh, some excellent new data from the, the new system now. And uh, 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 there's a photograph at the end of an experiment in front of the beam line at the, uh, uh, at the synchrotron lab in the Science Park in Shinju. Uh, and here's a model of, uh, this is AB stack by their graphene, but is it really? Uh, we may be making silicene, plumbing, germanine, or who knows? So stay tuned for my talk next year. So the uh, outline is first, um, what are atomistic models? Why do we need them? Second is, uh, why is surface science interesting and important? Third is, uh, uh, I'll give you some uh, abstracted, uh, one-dimensional uh, models for beads and springs to illustrate what um, uh, finding a minimum surface, con minimum configurations of uh, molecular models are, would be like. And those will just run in, in simple, pure Python and talk about how to extend it to two dimensions. And then we'll go on to molecular dynamics with lamps. And finally, how to look at the results uh, using a, an, uh, a, a rendering and animation uh, software called Blender, which runs in Python also. Okay. So uh, uh, the early work on material modeling was all uh, con what we say continuum modeling. Okay, these were like fluids, uh, like basically water. So hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic uh, refers to the the way water moves. You have pressure, you have uh, velocity. Uh, and uh, the early mathematicians like Bernoulli and Euler, and you have to be careful to get the correct Bernoulli when you start looking things up, okay? Um, so uh, other forms of continuum models uh, would be like a beam, a beam of metal. How does it bend? And exactly what shape does it bend in when you put pressure at one end, okay? And these can be solved uh, assuming it's continuous and uniform material. Uh, you can do this with uh, uh, calculus differential equations. Okay, and fluid dynamics is an extension also of, of the continuum uh, mechanics, but it has no atoms in it. Now, uh, why do we need atomistic models? I'm not going to give a talk about that. This is about Python, and there are so many good talks about that already. Uh, I'll just refer you to this one. So let's just take a, a real quick uh, look at this. Okay, this was in 2006. This is just when uh, molecular dynamics and LAMPS was really taking off. I'll um, uh, just quickly go through this so you get the idea of why this is a good talk to go see. But uh, um, we talk about how it interfaces with models of atoms themselves and also models, uh, macroscopic models, uh, on the scale of uh, moles and larger. Okay, and so it goes through the simple derivations of uh, how atoms are. are modeled, how they're calculated, what types of potentials are used. Okay, so uh, I refer you to that instead of trying to reproduce that. And um, just for completeness, uh, two things I won't talk about. One is a density functional theory, which is a purely quantum mechanical model, and uh, you can use that to find a minimum energy configuration. And in fact, there really is a time-dependent DFT 
as well. The other one that's been in the news recently is artificial intelligence. I think every talk uh, uh, about modeling will probably, in the future, will probably address uh, AI in some way or another, and this has uh, really been in the news recently. Um, the entire protein universe, AI predicts the shape of nearly every known protein. So this is a, a, a pretty much the opposite of molecular dynamics. Okay, so why is surface science important and what are 2D materials? So surfaces are the meeting place where atoms can do interesting things, okay? If you mix materials in a liquid, they dissolve at the surface, they condense on surfaces, they, um, and catal catalysts, uh, materials will interact with each other, okay? Even cells have surface, and this is the, the surface of a cell is where it interacts with the, uh, the outside environment, okay? And also, when you make a material on the surface, a two-dimensional material, like a one-layer or two-layer material, um, they show properties called emergent properties, which you do not see in bulk because of the reduced dimensionality. Okay, the most uh, popular 2D material is, of course, graphene. Most people have heard of it a little bit, at least. But there are many other, uh, they're called exenes, which is a, a honeycomb-like graphene, but uh, with other atoms, and more complicated two-dimensional materials. Okay. And there are even journals just, just for carbon or for fullerenes, uh, conferences about graphene, okay? Uh, this original materials, uh, just forms of carbon, start, started out as uh, buckyballs or fullerenes, went to nanotubes, went to sheets of graphenes. Um, all of these were supposed to give us something amazing, and so far we haven't gotten any real actual new products. Uh, nanotubes were not made into filaments to take us to space. Um, but now with a variety of 2D materials that are, are, are possible and uh, layers, uh, heterostructures of multiple materials stacked on top of each other, there really is a chance of something uh, new happening, okay? Uh, for example, just this, uh, uh, multiple layers of twisted or uh, rotated uh, layers of graphene is really thought uh, uh, to uh, potentially provide a, a way to get uh, some really uh, interesting and potentially useful uh, superconducting materials. Okay, so here's an illustration of multiple layers of graphene, um, an envisionment, uh, and, and also a demonstration of a device built on multiple layers of uh, stacked graphene. So, okay. Yes, that's been in the news. Uh, when you stack materials, you get these moray patterns, okay, when the two materials are, are either the same material but rotated or different materials with different lattice constants, you have these moray patterns. And we use, uh, we use Python to study these moray patterns, okay? This is a, an example of a, of a higher order coincidence where you have uh, hexagonal atoms here and a honeycomb on top of it, and those two lattices are coincident at several points. It's called a higher order coincidence. And uh, this, for example, is just a, a program using uh, the matplotlib widgets, and it's extremely useful. We can just uh, adjust things and watch the uh, the uh, patterns change in real time, so maybe next year the Python science GUIs will be uh, a, a good talk. So here are examples of, uh, of, of what moray patterns look like, and um, here's an actual moray pattern seen on a, on, a, on a surface, okay, and this is actually lead atoms arranged on a silver surface, and they're both hexagonal, but they have different lattice constants, so you get this interference pattern, and you can read more about uh, more about it here in our paper. So, oh, sorry, and that's the Fourier transform of this pattern, so you can see the different periodicities. And even though you cannot see the silver atoms, it shows up in, in, the, uh, in the Fourier transform because it's encoded in the two other patterns you can see. So we make various materials, uh, and let's get back to modeling these van der Waal materials. Van der Waal meaning they are not uh, covalently bound to the substrate, uh, they are just attracted to by various weaker forces. Okay, so let's go back to the balls and spring model. So let's look at the uh, example. So uh, imagine uh, uh, beads connected by springs, and then imagine a potential or a force underneath them that influence their, their, their position. Okay, this is called a, a frankl uh, kontorova model or frank van der Waer model. Um, Okay, so you have atoms as point masses connected by springs representing atomic bonds. The interaction with the surface is weak, maybe a sinusoidal surface, uh, uh, energy surface. Okay, so the atoms will move, these black dots show the atoms move to, um, 
new energy. So you can see they like to collect near the bottoms of the energy potential. Okay, so sometimes they move towards each other, sometimes they move away from each other. Okay, so uh, in classical uh, molecular dynamics, you solve Newton's second law of motion, which is F equals ma. So, or a, I should say a is equal to F over m. So the, 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 uh, you have this two differential equations, the, change in, the rate of change of velocities, the force over the mass, the rate of change of position is the velocity. And in order to get things to settle down and find an equilibrium position, you need to add a damping term also, so which is a, a, a force in the opposite. So if the velocity is this way, you have the force in the opposite way. That's classical uh, damping. So you set this up as an initial value problem and with these ingredients, the initial state vector, which is the positions and velocities, masses, the interaction characteristics, and the external forces, if there are any, and then you solve this. Okay, um, for the, the bonds between atoms, you can use a simple harmonic oscillator potential, you can use something like a Leonard Jones, or you can use something much more complicated, but we'll just, for now, just use this harmonic oscillator like a spring. And so let's start by using a psi pi integrate to uh, uh, solve these things. So here are some demos. And uh, the first one I'm going to, the first initial value problem I'm going to uh, show is just uh, uh, the Earth orbiting around the sun because it's a very simple one. We're a little bit familiar with it. We, we understand it. Uh, the force points towards the sun. Okay, so uh, we just have a simple uh, uh, expression for the force. The, the, the derivative of the position is the velocity the derivative of the velocity is acceleration. And that acceleration uh, of the Earth is a vector pointing towards the sun. And this expression here gives you 1 over r squared. Uh, the magnitude is 1 over r squared, and the direction is uh, towards the sun. That's what the minus sign does. Okay, uh, We can use some simple units. g and m of the sun equals 1. Semi-major axis equals 1. Uh, let's start with the eccentricity of 0. Okay, a period of 2 pi. So in this unitless uh, uh, world, the period of a planet is 2 pi. Okay, now the integrator, uh, we're going to use a, a classic uh, 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 integrator method here. Um, it uses its own time steps, and they're variable time steps. So the, the T evaluation is where you want the answer evaluated. So it integrates the motion in its own time steps. Then it goes back at these T eval points and interpolates the, uh, the values internally to find the best fit point at your time points. But it's, these don't control the integration uh, time points. And so we just run solve IB, IVP, sorry, sci pi integrate, solve IVP, and uh, take a look at what happens. So let's give it a try. OK. Um, so uh, here we go. So we have the, the planet going around exactly once. Um, I've color-coded some of the points to, to see it, and it's all worked. And if we change the eccentricity uh, to 0.5, we still should get a closed uh, shape. My goodness. Very nice. Okay, go to our next example here. Okay, uh, so let's now do the beads connected with springs. And while we're running it, we'll take a look at it. Okay, so, oh, there we, there we go. Okay, so these are the positions of uh, uh, 30 uh, beads connected by uh, 30 springs. The 30th spring is actually uh, going from here back down to here, but we've fixed the endpoints right now, okay? And so, and we've also plucked uh, this number 10. We've displaced to here and then let it... Uh, um, let it run for a while with no external, with no forces allowed, and then turn down the force here at time equals 20. So I'll show you what that looks like. So we have 30, uh, 30 atoms, 
uh, uh, same integrator. Okay, here's uh, the tenth uh, bead we have uh, displaced a little bit. So uh, the way we calculate the forces are is uh, this this contains the um, uh, the both the uh, force from the atom on the right and the atom on the left, and we divide by masses. You can see we're going from one to minus one because we're leaving the endpoints alone, and right now the damping is set at zero, so that's why we have. Uh, uh, this going on here. So uh, because this is fixed, we have a reflection. So the wave, uh, after we pluck this, the wave goes down, it reflects and goes back up. Same thing up here. We have a weaker reflection here. So we have uh, constructive interference in this area right there. So this is fun. It's interesting. It looks nice, but it doesn't tell us anything about the equilibrium position. They're just going to keep jiggling forever. Um, and who knows what will happen after uh, a very long time and some uh, uh, round off errors. So instead, uh, we, what we'd like to do is, uh, well, first, before we add the damping, let's address the uh, uh, boundary conditions. So I'll close that. And so let's add some periodic boundary conditions. So instead of uh, uh, integrating, oh, there we go. OK. So now we have periodic boundary conditions. So uh, this wave here continues here and goes, keeps going. This is used in molecular dynamics also, because you, you want to model a solid. It is going to have 10 to the 23 atoms, but you only want to model 1,000 or a million atoms. So uh, as hopefully it's a crystal or it's some continuous uh, uh, a medium. You use periodic boundary conditions. So if an atom leaves one way, it, it returns from the other side. OK, so this is uh, very important. So this, this wave here just continues and wraps around here. That wave continues and wraps around there. So uh, that works. But instead of uh, using the, um, uh, 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 fixing the, the endpoints here, now we just, we use NumPy roll. Okay, and NumPy roll is a quick way to shift an array over one, or multiple dimensions as far as you like, and it will automatically wrap the indices around uh, so that your, your right-hand side is connected to your left-hand side. So you can create a, one or two or n-dimensional torus if you uh, uh, use enough, roll enough times. So add, add a little bit of damping. Okay, so now you can see the, the uh, oscillations are damping out atoms are moving back to their uh, equilibrium positions, we can, uh, we can over damp it, okay. uh, we can add more damping, not over damped yet. And now you can see there's just a few oscillations here. Everything returns to its equilibrium position uh, very quickly. And if you want to overdamp, uh, it gets uh, more pathological. In fact, it takes longer to reach the equilibrium position if you damp too much. OK. Next, we're going to add a uh, periodic potential uh, to that, which is, would be the same as the atoms underneath uh, uh, the, the atoms that we're looking at. Yeah, that's the uh, uh, heavily damped. And you can see it takes quite a while to reach uh, equilibrium, equilibrium position. So now let's add a periodic uh, potential. My goodness, close this. And go back to here. So now we're adding a, a periodic potential right here, a, force, a periodic, in, the, in fact, this is a periodic force, which is just the gradient of the potential. So we're going to add a force that, that moves things either right or left, uh, depending on uh, 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 wh where you are. Okay. So now here's this periodic force. We're, we're damped, but sure enough, they, they, their equili equilibrium positions are now uh, altered. So where the force is positive, they're pushed up. 
and so they cluster here. Where the force is negative, they're pushed down. So they're clustering here where, the, where, the, where uh, it has an up force on one side and a down force on the other. Okay. And uh, that's, if we uh, increase that uh, uh, potential and run it again, it's going to get worse or better, depending on uh, your point of view. Yes. And then uh, in we're, the next we'll look at is using minimize instead of a dynamical uh, model to, to uh, see how that affects. So sure enough, yeah, if we have a very large force, you can see they go crazy and they cluster uh, in certain areas. In fact, they've, some of these may have even jumped uh, over uh, a, uh, uh, one atom to get to the next one. Okay. So let's look at minimize. So what, how is that different here? Is that? No, not that one. Okay, so let's try uh, uh, using minimize instead of uh, a dynamical model. So SciPy minimize, uh, um, it, it has, it, it calls several different um, algorithms, you, you have a choice, that find a mathematical minima. Uh, and these are not dynamical, so the atoms no longer have mass. They, this is just abstractly or mathematically calculating the minimum energy configuration. So now we must supply not a force, but an actual energy to, to minimize. And so the energy stored in the spring is, is, is now the uh, uh, x minus uh, a, which is the equilibrium distance squared. Okay, and uh, so then we add all the energies together and return a single energy and pass that energy to um, uh, minimize. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, how, how that works. And that's also gonna find the minimum. And sure enough, now the, uh, it is possible to extract intermediate results from minimize, but they don't have the same meaning because the method that the minimization algorithm uses to find the positions is, is, is not relevant to the physics. So here I'm just plotting the initial and final positions. And sure enough, they cluster at the low energy, uh, uh, low energy areas. So we store some energy in the springs but we recover, we, have, we recover more energy by going to the minimum in the applied potential. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, simulated annealing. I mentioned it in the abstract. Um, it's not that widespread used. I, uh, I started using it 30 years ago, calculating diffractive optical elements where you have to constantly change uh, all the pixels or some of the pixels and look for an improvement in the uh, diffraction pattern that they produce. Um, but just for completeness, let's talk about it here. So um, all we need is the energy in this case, we're minimizing the energy, okay? Uh, but we have something called a, a temperature and an anneal schedule. We have a parameter called temperature, it's units of energy, and we slowly decrease the temperature until the simulation is finished. And how is that temperature used? Okay, the method uh, constantly jiggles or uh, changes the uh, configuration by adding small random numbers to uh, the positions. And then we recalculate the energy after each change. So if the change in energy, dE, uh, is negative, if it goes, energy goes down, we of course keep it. If the energy goes up, sometimes we keep it and sometimes we don't. And so uh, the way that's done here is that you put this delta E and divided by your, your, param your temperature parameter, which is the thing that's slowly uh, decreasing. And uh, if you take the, uh, the exponential of the negative delta E over T, you get a small positive uh, a number, okay? The larger the uh, energy, the closer to zero. So this is, a, right, this is minus DE over T. So if the DE is much bigger than T, this value will be very close to zero, 
the chances that it's greater than a random number between zero and one get smaller and smaller for large DE. So for big changes in energy, we almost never keep it. Uh, for small increases in energy, we let them go. We keep them much more frequently. Okay, that's the, in a nutshell, that's simulated annealing. Um, and so uh, the amount that we jiggle, we also ramp down uh, along with the temperature because once you're closer, you don't need to uh, shake it up as much. Okay, so if we, uh, if we run this script, we, what we'll see is that uh, it's now taking a random, not a random walk, but a semi-random walk from the uh, initial configuration to the final, final lowest energy configuration. So the lines are now going to be uh, a lot more jiggly. These are some, uh, this is energy um, and uh, decision making. And so sure enough, we see this random uh, variation. It's shaking, it's shaking, it's shaking, but slowly they, they decide on their equilibrium position uh, after, after some time here. So uh, we won't use that in molecular dynamics, but for completeness, I just wanted to add that. Okay. Finally, let's talk about fire. So um, uh, this is a, an algorithm. It's, it's, it's a dynamical algorithm like the, the original solve IVP, except it uses a very simple integration technique but a lot more decision making, uh, be, and, and this is this is much more uh, flexible because you can have external forces, you can have things changing. Atoms can move closer, or far farther away from each other. Interactions can change with time. So the fire algorithm uh, is a much simpler one. It's essentially uh, uh, like going downhill. So I'll I'll show you a couple of uh, of uh, presentations here. Yep. So uh, let's go back up and take a look at the, uh, uh, yeah, so let's take a look at fire. And this is an excellent presentation. There's no reason for me to try to uh, reproduce it in my talk. Just uh, take a look at the link. Okay, and this is 2006 when this was uh, really, uh, uh, really introduced and caught on. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice introduction to the algorithm. Okay, and so the, the minimization uh, problem is, is, uh, is uh, the analogy is a skier on a hill trying to get down to the bottom to uh, have lunch, for example. Uh, but the problem is here, suppose you're on the hill and you want to get to the bottom, but you don't know where that is, okay? But you're smart enough, you're clever, so that you know you have to start by going downhill. So the skier begins by going uh, 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 a downhill, but the problem is that the hill is complicated shape. So it's very soon you find yourself, you're still going in this direction, but downhill has now changed to a new direction. Um, and so what you do is you, uh, if you notice that, that you, you're not going uh, straight downhill, you start giving yourself these little bumps in uh, a little force, these little impulses to move your velocity closer and closer to where downhill is. And remember, downhill is also changing because you're on a complicated surface here. And that allows you to, uh, to uh, fall uh, uh, faster and faster downhill. And alternatively, uh, if you find yourself uh, going in a certain direction and suddenly the, the, the shape of the hill changes and you're going up, you, you realize that your downhill is this way, but your velocity is this way. You just stop immediately, okay? And set your velocity to zero and allow yourself to start falling downhill again. So it's a very simple and robust uh, algorithm. And uh, let's take a look at the next one. So uh, this is uh, uh, fire as it's been implemented in lamps, also in 2006. Uh, here they have the, uh, this is an excellent uh, review of the method and its incorporation into, into lamps. Here's the original algorithm. Here it is in, uh, uh, explained in some math. And here is the original algorithm one. And that's what I've uh, put here in Python. Uh, it's been improved with algorithm two, which is uh, in Fire 2.0, which is uh, um, has been enhanced. But we'll just we'll just look at the the basic implementation uh, of of the uh, of the algorithm. So let's take a look. Yes, so we need both the force and the energy because uh, we need to know how to change the velocity depending on where downhill is. But we also need to see if uh, double check that we are decreasing the energy. So we'll, we need to call both of the both the force 
and the uh, energy. And luckily for the spring model, it's simple. Okay, and uh, once again here, if uh, so P is just the dot product of the force and the velocity. So P is going to be positive if you're heading somewhere roughly in the same direction as uh, the, uh, the downhill, and it's going to be negative if you're going the wrong way. So you literally stop, set velocity to zero, and start falling downhill again. So let's, uh, let's take a look at how, how, that, uh, how that works. Sorry. Okay, it worked beautiful. Okay, I'll show you the potential in a minute. But we can see uh, positions uh, actually started all oh, started going straight downhill here, but at, at different rates. Some of them moved quicker than others. Uh, once we got to about 40, and it looks like we're on our way to, to the bottom of the hill. Uh, okay, let's start in the beginning. In the beginning, not very much happened. So the, the uh, time step, uh, after 20 uh, steps, that's a parameter, uh, it started increasing the uh, delta t, the time steps, in order to get some action. Once they all started moving and some of them started reaching the bottom of the hill, it dropped the, the time step back down again and gave it a couple of more nudges here. And we can see the energy falling quickly to the, uh, to the uh, minimum here. And sure enough, uh, all the atoms found their way. So I was really, really quite pleased to see. I just typed the algorithm in from the paper, and boom, uh, it, it worked the first time. Okay. Uh, in reality, you would not do this in, in pure Python. You would do this in compiled code, because it's just branches and decisions and evaluations. Okay. And that's, that, that's what LAMPS has done. Okay. Yes. Okay, and, and we can take a look at the, um, uh, oh, let's just go directly to the uh, 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 molecular dynamics. Yeah. And uh, in this paper, they, they uh, uh, use fire in lamps and apply it to several uh, uh, real-world problems that you would use in molecular dynamics. Here's a configuration of a molecule. Here's arrangements like, like we're doing, arrangements of atoms on a, on a surface, uh, and compare it to different models. And again, once again, it, it just it finds downhill and it just goes there. So it works quite well. OK, so uh, our models are two-dimensional, not one-dimensional. So it's not beads on a, on a connected with strings. Uh, springs, excuse me. Uh, so we need to make a hexagonal two-dimensional array of atoms. Uh, so we generate the positions, zero out the velocities, and we define the bonds using a NumPy indexing. So for example, bond number one is between zero, atom zero and one, bond number two is between atom zero and two, okay, etc. Okay, and this is what that looks like. Okay, so here's a, a flake of, uh, of um, maybe 150 atoms on a uh, periodic potential. So now, instead of a sine wave, it's a two-dimensional two hexagonal uh, equivalent of that sine wave for, the, for this energy surface. Uh, the atoms are color-coded to show their, their potential energy. So this atom right here is on top of a hill, so it's yellow because it's high energy. This atom right here is purple because it's in a hollow here between the uh, peaks, so that's the lowest energy. And once you let that run dynamically, excuse me, uh, once you let that run dynamically, let's get that back there, uh, what happens? The uh, energy decreases. So we can see the, uh, the energy from the substrate uh, dropped by about 12 or 13. So that's why we don't have these yellow atoms. The, by moving out of the way, they stretch the springs. So the energy in the bond goes up, but the total energy has gone down. And an interesting thing has happened. This whole, uh, this whole flake here has rotated from 9.5 to 8.3 uh, 8 degrees. Okay, so that's part of the relaxation process. <clears throat> Here's a similar situation with a much smaller flake. Let's say right after nucleation, the island is, is just starting to grow. 
And uh, again, we've, uh, we've minimized the energy, but it's rotated here to uh, 4.2 degrees. So our, our tiny little island has actually uh, managed to go over the hills and rotate. This is dynamically, right? It, it's, not a, it's not a mathematical wide search. It had to go, all the atoms, their trajectories had to go over these hills in order to get to this uh, 4.2 degree uh, minimum uh, energy configuration. Now, some of the problems may, we may want to solve are much larger. And Python really runs out of steam. Uh, you have two choices uh, uh, when you want to solve a, a molecular dynamics problem in Python. You either put your, uh, your code as compiled code and call it from Python, put it in a Python wrapper, or just start to use a new program. So uh, I'm going to talk about LAMPS which stands for Large Scale Atomic and Molecular Massively Parallel Simulator, LAMPS. Okay. Um, so LAMPS will run on a, on a laptop, it will run on a supercomputer, it will run on a cluster. Um, it's, it's really designed to, uh, uh, to work well in the computing environment that suits your problem. And you can uh, start it from uh, Mac OS, Linux, or Windows. Uh, if I take a search, uh, the terms LAMPS Molecular Dynamics and use Google Scholar starting from 2000, you can see we started out here at sort of uh, 50 or 100 papers a year. And then around 2010, it really took off. In uh, 2021, there was over 6,000 papers uh, about LAMPS and molecular dynamics. So this is really a wide, widely accepted and used uh, simulation environment in many fields of research, not just surface science. Okay, the, the website is very helpful. It's free, open source, well supported. There's a very large community of users. You can get your questions answered. You can find examples. Um, so you can start by reading about the features. You can download it here, get information how to install. There's a, there's a manual, there's online help that works well. And for developers, by the way, there's this event here in August and September. Okay, uh, just from the online help, you can see there's uh, uh, many, uh, many things you can find out, uh, including the uh, Python where you can call uh, and run LAMPS from Python. And that's very helpful if you want to use Python to look at the output of one simulation and decide what your next parameters are going to be, sort of intelligent scripting of the LAMPS executable, then you can submit the job. It could be to another supercomputer or a cluster and wait for the results. Okay, and then a lot of technical detail about how to uh, build your atoms here. There's help everywhere for LAMPS. Uh, here's some tutorials I found particularly helpful to get started. And here's the, uh, the YouTube uh, URL codes for, for these particular videos. There's many more. This one is also particularly helpful when you're choosing the atom style. And I like this graphic because it helps illustrate that the atoms could be actual atoms, or the atoms could be more atomistic. They could represent molecules, they could represent clusters, they could re represent grains of sand, <clears throat> they could represent cells in your blood. Okay, so it's really uh, uh, incredibly flexible. I strongly recommend this one as a way to get going. Um, it will give you an idea <clears throat> of the different ways that lamps can be used. And what's going on under the hood? What, what LAMPS is actually doing? It's solving these dynamical uh, uh, equations um, in an intelligent way. So there's actual uh, steps. It has to do some integration of the motion, the equations of motion. Then it has to decide uh, what's going on. Do I have to reevaluate the interaction between atoms? And very importantly, it has to reevaluate if a new atom has moved into the neighborhood. <clears throat> you can imagine if there are... Uh, a million atoms, you have a trillion interactions. <clears throat> so you have to limit your interactions to a neighborhood. And every certain number of steps, you recalculate who has entered your neighborhood and is worthy of considering as being a potential uh, source of interaction. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I built a, a surface, an SEC 111 crystal surface. Uh, LAMPS offers some uh, ability to create crystal structures and lattices, um, but I found it much easier just to build it myself. And then I put a surface layer on top of it, and I worked out the math, and then encoded that in the Python. So let's take a look at 
FCC box 02. Let me go to the right directory. So the Python script uh, builds my atoms, saves the atom locations in a, in a data file, um, calculates some other parameters, and, and encodes those also in the, you know, the, the size of the space, the volume, okay, and sort of prepares the header in the, uh, the data file that, that contains all the uh, uh, atom locations. So if we, uh, if we run that, let's take a look. Change directory here. Okay. Sorry. Should be almost instant. It's the uh, OBS software in the back. Okay, so it's now created my atoms. Six layers of a substrate. And uh, some atoms on top here. Yep, there they are. Displaying in 3D Matplotlib. <clears throat> so it's created an output, well, input data. That's the output, which is the location of the atoms, <clears throat> and it's created a uh, dump file. I'm going to lose my voice today, so no point in stopping. Uh, this is a fake dump file. <clears throat> the software is called uh, Ovito. Excuse me. It's free. It's used to um, <clears throat> look at outputs of various programs, uh, including uh, LAMPs. And so here's a, a, a simple rendering of the atoms in my substrate and the uh, atoms on top. <clears throat> and the, uh, the, the uh, data is just a, a long text file containing all the uh, atom locations. And some headers here just describing how the atoms. Two types of atoms, atom type 1, atom type 2 and uh, the, the way they, they interact with each other, and then atom number, atom ID, which is one or two, and then XYZ. Okay, and so then let's, let's run it. So we will enter the environment where it's installed, And then the command for running your installed lamps is lmp underscore serial. Okay, that was it, because it, I, I didn't ask it to do anything complicated. I just asked it to read in the atoms and minimize the energy by moving them slightly. And uh, that will create a log file and another, and a real dump file. Uh, this one doesn't look so good. I won't show it to you because the atoms are the wrong size. So. Uh, I, I found the, uh, the, the software limiting in, in terms of looking at the atoms, so instead I'm going to talk about Blender. Uh, I'll just show this quickly. This is a, I ran, there, there's hundreds of demos in the installation, so you can find a demo that's similar to your problem and run it. Um, and I just ran one which is a deposition, and it has a small unit cell here, but it's uh, depositing these uh, molecules onto a surface. And you can see it has a periodic boundary conditions, so an atom that goes out of one side reappears on the other side there. So that's why they, they seem to be jiggling. Okay. So uh, uh, the, as the simulation runs, it continues to dump uh, the uh, positions and velocities and which atoms are bound to each other depending on uh, how you set up your uh, interaction. And you can generate movies with it. So here's a, a, a quick, simple movie. Um, but I'm going to talk about Blender next. So... Let's uh, first let's go to the uh, oh we're okay yeah so let's run Blender and it's important to run it from a command line because that way when there are Python errors they're reported uh, here in the in the console. And Blender is free, open source. It's uh, 
used for animation, rendering. Um, a, a lot of animated films are made with Blender, but I, I like it because it has, it's, has a pure Python interface. So you can uh, embed scripts, Python scripts in it, and you can actually run Blender from Python. You use the BPY module. You don't even need this interaction here. Okay, so here's uh, the Blender cube, and a, and a light will immediately delete everything and go to scripting. And let's open up a... Uh, find this. I'm just going to show you how, how easy this is. Uh, let's... So here's a script that Jaying wrote that uh, created a new script that reads in those uh, atomic positions into Blender. So we just paste it into the uh, script window and run it, and it will create. Hopefully, it will create a crystal surface with some atoms on top. Yes. So if we take a look, there it is. So uh, let's delete everything. And, yeah. and modify the script. Right now, I'm just using this to draw static images and manipulate them, but you can uh, animate that. You can make the, all the atoms move. You can, they can track the velocity, just like the other uh, uh, video we saw. So I'll make, just show that I can make the atoms smaller, run the script again. Oops, I hit save, sorry. And there they are. And I think the color will kick in in a second. Okay, so it's actually very fast. It's just the uh, OBS software in the background that's uh, uh, making it look like it's slow. Okay. So here is an arrangement, a honeycomb. This could be graphene or silicene or germanine or some uh, two-dimensional two uh, exine honeycomb material on some atoms. Okay, and this shading helps a little bit better. So these illustrations can be used for publication. They can use, be used for teaching. They can be animated so we can watch materials grow and uh, change, uh, anneal. Uh, in, in any process we need, we can animate through Blender and, and make films and actually publish the films along with the publications. So I think it's really a, an ideal platform for communicating results from a molecular dynamics and sharing them with others. Thank you for your time. And uh, I will uh, uh, get these scripts onto the GitHub update the PowerPoint by the time the, uh, the, of the conference. Thank you for your time. If you have any further questions, you're welcome to contact me by email. Thank you.